This is the last program of block three, and in it we're going to look at two functions, the logarithm function and the exponential function. Let's begin where you first met the logarithm function on TV. Remember this? It's the graph of t maps to one upon t. Alan Solomon looked at this in a block two program. And what he did was to work out the area between one and two under this curve. What we're going to do is be more general. We're going to look at the area from one to x. And now that we've done some calculus, we know we can write that as the integral from one to x of one over t dt. Now, what Alan did was to just look at the special value, x is two. And he got an answer that looked like the Napierian log of two. But is this always the case? Can we always say that this area from one to x is the log of x? Or rather, that this integral from one to x is the log of x? Now it's important at this stage to realize that we can't. And so for this program, we're going to treat this as a mystery function. It needs a name. So we'll call it L of x to emphasize our suspicion that L is in fact a log function. Now, it's only a suspicion at this point, and in this program, we're going to confirm that suspicion. Also, we're going to look at another function which turns out to be even more important than L, namely its inverse function. And we're going to look at the calculus of these functions. But let's begin at the beginning. Let's start with L. L, what does it look like? What's its shape? We started with the one over t function. The area from one up to one is zero, of course. When x equals two, the area from one up to two has this value. For x is four, it's this. And for x is eight, it's this. We can do that for all values of x. Now we got that by looking at the area to the right of one. Moving to the left, we see the rest of the graph. So this is what the mystery function L of x looks like. It rises steeply here close to the axis, and as x increases, it gradually flattens off. So it looks like a log function, all right. Now, we said we were also going to be interested in calculus. The derived function of L. What does that look like? We're starting with L of x. We're taking the slope of the tangent and plotting that. Then, that's the derived function. Now, you might say I've been a bit thick here. This derived function looks exactly like the function we started with, and so it ought. We started with t maps to one over t. From the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that L of x, the area function, is a primitive of one upon t. So that when we form its derived function, L prime of x, then we must get back to the function we started with. That is, the derived function is the one over function. Now then, what have we done? We've started with a function L of x, and we know what it looks like. We've looked at its derived function, we know what it looks like. It's the one over function. To start with, we said we were also going to be interested in another mystery function, the inverse function of L. How about that one? So we've decided that the next stage in the investigation is to look at the inverse of L. But how can I find out about that? Well, here's the graph of L, and I can find the graph of its inverse by reflecting in this diagonal line, y equals x. It needs a name, so I've called it E. What else can I find out about it, just by knowing that it's the inverse of L? Well, one of the things that Dan did was to differentiate L, so let us look at the derived function of E. 
Here's the function e. And here's its derived function. But what about this? The derived function of e is e itself. Now that is surprising. How could we have possibly anticipated that? But now we know what we're looking for, we can use calculus to help us get to it. If we start with e of x, then because l is the inverse function, we can write that l of e of x is equal to just x. We're looking for a derived function, so let's differentiate this. It's a composite function, so we need to use the chain rule. That means that we first differentiate L to give us L dashed of E of X, and then multiply by the derived function of E, which is E dashed of X. Now differentiating the X gives us 1. What about this L dashed? What's that? Well, Dan told us that to differentiate L just gives us 1 over. So this is 1 over E of X. Multiplied by E dashed of X. And that's equal to 1. Rearranging that gives E dashed of X equals E of X. E is its own derived function, which puts it in a class of its own. It's worthy of much more investigation. But what is E? Before we can find out more about that, we need to go and have another look at L. In fact, you already know more about L. I hope you've already done the exercise in which you showed that L has the basic logarithm property. Here it is. L of A times B is equal to L of A plus L of B. It's true of all logs. It's true of logs to base 10, to base anything. Now there's a further property you're going to have to show, and it's this one. It's another log-like property, and it's that L of A to the power B is equal to B times L of A. And you're going to have to do it for any values of A and B. In this program, I'm going to do it for some special values of A and B. I'm going to put A equal to 2 and B equal to 4. That is, I'm going to find, rather I'm going to show, that L of 2 to the power 4 is equal to 4 times L of 2. That's L of 16, that's 2 to the 4th, is 4 lots of L of 2. Let's run quickly through the maths. This is L of 2 to the 4th, written in terms of the definition as an integral. The object is to get this in terms of L of 2. Now there's a trick. You make the substitution u to the 4th for t. How's this going to change it? What about the limits? They're right for L of 2. What about 1 over t? What about dt? You'll notice that's 4u cubed du. And with a bit of simplifying and cancelling, you get to this integral. Now u is just a dummy variable. u or t, it makes no difference. The integral is just 4 times L of 2, which is what we wanted to prove. L of 2 to the 4th is 4 lots of L of 2. So that's it for L of 2 to the 4th. What you've got to do is do it for L of A to the B, in the same way. Now, that's done the maths, but what does it look like? The L function is about area under this curve, 1 over T. This is L of 2. Scale it by a factor of 2. That doubles the area. Then, scale it by a factor half in the y direction.
so this area is also L of 2. We can do that again. Our original area can be scaled by a factor 4 in the x direction, and then contracted by a quarter in the y direction. So again, we get L of 2. But what about going as far as 2 to the 4th? That's 16. Stretch and contract. Now, what's important about this? Let's look at what we've done. What we've done is to take this area, which is L of 2, and deform it so that it fits here, here, and here without changing the value of the area. In other words, we're going up in equal increments of L of 2, here, 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 and so on. And what does that mean? It means that we go from 1 to 2 to 2 squared to 2 cubed along here. In other words, going, along in, going up in equal increments of L means we go up here in powers of 2. And we don't have to have 2s here. We could just as easily write any number for this 2. So we could have A, L of A, L of A here. These would become A, A squared, A cubed. So going up in equal increments of L would mean we're going up in powers. Now, that's fine, but remember, we've done it for the area under the curve 1 over t. What we need to do now is see what that looks like on the graph of L itself. So let's put that information on the graph of L. The equal steps go up the side and the powers along the x-axis. A maps to L of A. A squared maps, of course, to L of A squared, but we've now seen that that's twice L of A. A cubed maps to 3L of A. Now we can get from this to the graph of E by reflecting again. There's E, and the equal steps now go along the x-axis with the powers up the side. L of A maps to A, twice L of A maps to A squared, and three times L of A maps to A cubed, and so on. So we're beginning to see what E looks like. It's beginning to look a bit like a power function. In fact, if this was 1, 2 and 3, we would have 1 maps to A, 2 maps to A to the power 2, and 3 maps to A to the power 3. In fact, x maps to A to the x. So our function E is beginning to look like a power function, but it all hinges on L of A being equal to 1. That means that here the area under the graph of 1 over t from 1 up to some number, we want to be precisely 1. That number turns out to be 2.718281830101 and a whole lot more decimals besides. It's irrational. You can't write it down and you can't handle it as a number, so it's given a special name. It's called little e. That makes the function capital E of x 2.718 to the power x, or e to the x. And it's called the exponential function, which is why we chose e in the first place. Here it is then. 1 maps to e, 2 maps to e to the power 2, 3 maps to e to the power 3, and so on. Now, from our previous calculations, we know that E, capital E of X, is its own derived function. That means that now we can write D by DX of E to the X is equal to E to the X itself. Now, what about the second derived function? Well, that's going to be differentiating 
e to the x again, which will be e to the x again. And in fact, no matter how many times we differentiate e to the x, we'll still get e to the x. Well, we've practically finished the story for capital E of x. You've seen what it looks like. You've seen how to differentiate it. We've seen that it's the power function of this number, e. And I've told you e to as many decimal places as I can remember. But you haven't finished the story yet until you can calculate e to as many decimal places as your calculator will go to. That's an exercise for you after the programme, and you'll have to use a Taylor series to calculate it. You'll find that especially easy because e to the x is so easy to differentiate. So where does that leave me? I was interested in the original mystery function, L. But if I know its inverse function, capital E, then I know L itself. Capital E, we found, is 2.718218, and all the rest of it, to the power x. Little e to the power x. That means that L must be the log of x to the same base. The log of x to base e. The so-called Napierian logarithm as originally suggested by Alan Solomon. Now then, that ends the story as far as the functions L and E are concerned. But why are they so important? What is E after all? Or what is E to the X after all? It's just a number raised to the power X. In that respect, it's just like 5 to the X, or 2 to the X, or 1.5 to the X. It fits in between them, like this. Where it's different from them is that it's the only one that differentiates to give exactly the function e to the x itself. It's the only one that's its own derived function. Now then, we can go further. Why stop at e to the x? Why not e to the 2x? or e to the 3x. Well, we know what our number e is, so it's no effort to look at e to the 2x. Here it is. Here's e to the 2x, and e to the x, and e to the point 5x. What's interesting about them is their shape. They look very much like 5 to the x and 2 to the x. So let's compare them. They look as if they all belong to the same family of curves. e to the 2x is steeper than 5 to the x, which in turn is steeper than e to the x. So perhaps something like e to the 1.5x is equal to 5 to the x. Perhaps we can find a number k such that e to the kx is equal to 5 to the x. Here's e to the x. That's e to the kx with k equal to 1. As we vary k, notice how e to the kx changes shape. This is e to the 2x. And this is e to the half x. As we change k, we get all the curves in between. Now here's 2 to the x and 5 to the x. Can we find the right value of k? This value gives exactly 2 to the x. And this gives 5 to the x.
Picking the right value of k, then, gives any power function. Here's a few of them. 2 to the x, 3 to the x, and so on. For example, look at 5 to the x. That has a k value of 1.6094 to four decimal places. That is, e to the 1.6094x is equal to 5 to the power x. So e to the kx is a pretty important family of functions. It's important because we can express any power function in that form, and we have the bonus that it makes the calculus easy. It's just because of this that mathematicians and scientists adopt the following convention. All functions, all power functions, are expressed in the form e to the kx. It's just because of this convention you almost never see objects like 2 to the x or 3 to the x. And it really does make the calculus easy, even when you have an ugly beast like a composition of functions. In fact, we're going to end the program by demonstrating this. Let's work out the derived function of something really horrible. Let's try e to the x squared and differentiate it. This is just the sort of thing you might be asked to do. So, how do you differentiate e to the x squared? Well, it's a composite. It's e to the something. So let's put that something equal to u. And then this becomes e to the u, and we have to differentiate that. First step is to differentiate e to the u, which is just e to the u. And then we need to multiply by du dx. What is du dx? Well, from here, du dx is equal to 2x. So that means that this is e to the u times 2x. And we need to go back to to x's. That's e to the x squared times 2x. So a composite function of e to the x is almost as easy to differentiate as e to the x itself. So we began the program with a mystery function. In finding it, we found another mystery function, its inverse function, with even more desirable properties. This led to expressing all power functions in the form e to the kx. And you've just seen that that makes the calculus easy. Therefore, it's got a very wide range of application. We can end block three now with a firm and generally accepted rule. All power functions and all log functions will be expressed from now on to the same base, e. Thank <laughs> you.